you know there are uh, people uh, still joining but we're, we're at the allocated time to start so I think at a courtesy for everyone who has uh, Who's dialed in will get started. Uh, my name is Connell McDevitt. I'm um, Hume Brophy's chief executive, and I'm chairing uh, what will be, I think, a really interesting discussion about optimizing relationships and getting the most out of uh, the relationship with your clients from a consultancy pr perspective. I have two amazing panelists, which I'll introduce you to in just a second. Uh, but before I do, can I can I thank everyone for for taking part in what is the last of the first round of uh, task force forum discussions. Uh, there have been uh, three today, so this is the fourth, and I know the task force looks forward to uh, announcing more forums, more discussions, and more opportunities for colleagues uh, around the world to uh, uh, learn from best practice and take advantage of these exceptional times to exchange ideas. Um, can I thank uh, the team at the PRCA and, and Corey in particular for making this all happen? We wouldn't be here without their good work. And can I also particularly thank Bess uh, Winston, who is sitting as a participant, but really should be doing what I'm doing here and chairing the session. And the only reason she isn't doing that is because Rob is a client of hers and she took the view that that would not be appropriate, uh, which I think is a testament to her, her standards and her approach. Uh, and uh, the way she, she likes to structure her relationship. So I'm a very poor substitute stepping in for her. And again, want to thank her for uh, all the work she's put in behind the scenes uh, to make this happen. So today is a discussion about optimizing relationships. We've got two great panelists, as I said. Uh, first of all, we're going to hear from Rob, Rob Six, and uh, we will then hear a response uh, from uh, Rachel Friend. Uh, both have extensive careers in communications. Both have worked uh, in-house and on the agency side. Rob is currently uh, the Vice President of Global uh, Communications at Avery Dennison, uh, and he has had a fairly distinguished career in-house, uh, but has also spent time at Edelman and uh, doing some other stuff earlier in his career too. I'm gonna ask Rob to kick off uh, uh, but before I do it, let me just introduce Rachel, who will be responding. Uh, Rachel has just uh, recently finished up uh, her, her, her stint as uh, Weber Shamwick's UK CEO. I think it's fair to say that in the world of consumer PR in the UK, Rachel Friend is one of the biggest of the big fish in what is already a very big pond. Um, she's also vice chair of the PRCA. So, uh, uh, has that role uh, on her hands as well, and has had a career which has principally been in consultancy, but at, at different points has been in-house, and most notably was a Sainsbury's uh, uh, lead on the consumer PR side for quite a period of time. So whilst Rob will be talking about the, uh, the in-house perspective, and I think Rachel's observations would probably be more from a consultancy point of view, be assured that both of them have walked in each other's shoes along the way uh, and I think that will hopefully make for a great, uh, a great session. Questions and answers, uh, we'll open it up uh, after the guys have made their, made their opening remarks. Please just uh, write to me in the chat forum there. Okay. I'll do my best to throw as much uh, at the panelists as I can possibly manage. Rob, if you're good on the technology and if you can hear me clearly, I'd like to invite you to say a few opening words. Uh, hello? Are you good there, Rob? How, how you doing? Are, can you hear me clearly? I can hear you. Can you hear me? I don't, my screen has gone we haywire. Can, we can hear you. So <laughs> if, if you okay. want to kick off with your opening remarks, if there's a problem, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll message you on the messenger, but please, the floor is yours. Yeah, just so, just so you know, I can't see my screen or anything. For some reason, my Mac just went haywire, but if you can hear me, that's fine talk to a black screen. Can you hear me just fine? We can hear you. Thank you. Thank you for being in this panel. It's very early for me here in Southern California. I um, have to talk about my relationship with consultants. And um, as, as you mentioned, I've been working with Best Winston and the Winston Agency for a number of years now at Avery Dennison. And, and first of all, just for pure uh, transparency, Bess and I have known each other for quite some time, worked together at Golden Harris uh, a number of years ago. 
Um, and, and what I have really found helpful, um, in particular with, with COVID-19, but in, in sort of all facets of the work that Bess has been um, working with me, is just her sort of deep commitment to, to the business. Um, she really feels like um, an extension of my team. And she really goes the extra mile to make sure that um, I'm up to date on trends. She's thinking about businesses and, and thinking about ways to bring value to, to Avery Denison. And I think that's really what really makes it work. It's really becoming a, a true partner um, to your comms um, contacts within the organization. It's really taking the time to invest in understanding the business. Um, so many times, I think, you know, from my outside experience of working at agencies, it's really hard to understand the company's strategy and then how you can use communications to, to, to amplify that strategy. And, and, and I think that for an important relationship or a client, client consultant relationship is really taking that time um, and investing probably a little bit more than you normally would that you would be able to bill for. Um, I feel that if you could take the time to understand the strategy um, to offer really candid advice to be that thought partner to bounce ideas. I think sometimes when you're a sort of a senior communications person within, an, within a company, company, you don't really have a lot of people you can bounce I, ideas off of sometimes. And sometimes you just, you, 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 you kind of, you're there, you're expected to know everything sometimes and um, really have a partner where you can share ideas and, um, and bounce ideas off of. It's been, been really helpful. Um, I think also it's been really great. She, um, I speak to Bess because it's my relevant experience because she's just been such a great partner to me. But I find that really um, she really understands when when to press and when not to press. Um, we've been incredibly busy uh, with COVID-19. We're a global business, um, manufacturing facilities all around the world. And so we began um, the impact of COVID back in January with our China facility that's moved around the world. And I originally hired Best for sustainability um, communications and, and um, influencer relationship building, things like that. But she's been able to pivot um, and pivot to doing pretty much whatever I can, whatever I really need, what I need an extra, um, some extra arms and legs. And, uh, and it's gone way beyond just sort of sustainability, more into crisis. I can send her something to take a look at. And she really understands how we talk and, and so she's been she's taken that time and she's been a our partner for about five years and so I know when I can hand something off to her it's going to get done and I have to do very little to to make changes and then send it off and also I've learned to trust her to um, you know what's been helpful for her and one with a, a number of different players within Avery Denison and we've we've grown um, to trust her and, um, and, and that way she's been able to go to different parts of the business and work for them and have separate contracts and separate projects. And I know that I don't have to follow up on it um, and that she's doing a great job. So it's a little bit of really investing that time and energy into the business, understanding the strategies, and really just delivering acceptable work. And you, when you have all three of those, I think you can have a really solid partnership that really just continues on. And uh, that's you know how it's worked for me, and and I have found it to be to be quite quite beneficial. So I'll pause there. I'm not sure if there's some Q and A back and forth. If there's anything I need to to continue talking about, but I welcome the dialogue. Thanks, Robin. Thank you for those opening remarks. I took away trust and developing relationships of trust between the consultant and the in-house team. Uh, Rachel, would you respond, and then we can throw it open to the uh, to the group. Of course, and um, thank you very much for inviting me to uh, be part of this panel. Um, as you say, it's all about trust in the end, isn't it? Uh, trust is earned, and um, you know, great trust and relationships grow over time. And Ro that what Rob's describing that that relationship he has with Bess Winston at the Winston Agency, it clearly has grown over time, which is amazing. Um, I. I do feel lucky I was in house for a little while, so I recognize everything that Rob's saying. Um, and in fact, um, whilst I've been back in consultancy, we've done a lot of client panels uh, to just try and understand what it is that the clients really want. And the feedback is pretty universal. Um, and it, it sort of rings true for me when I was in house as well. So um, 
I used to write briefs and our clients write briefs as well. And they think everything's in the brief, but you know what? Sometimes not everything's in the brief because we're all humans, right? And we're writing it down on a piece of paper, hoping that we've captured everything. And I think a lot of trust can come really from, you know, the just original brief or discussions that you're having to be that strategic partner and the sparring partner with your client. You know, I used to have to walk into um, big stakeholder meetings in house and I was taking in the viewpoint of the agency and I needed to make sure that what I was taking in I fundamentally believed was right um, and so I needed that sparring partner with you know I didn't want my agency to be an order taker I wanted it to be a sparring partner with me um, as Rob says you know often the most senior comms person needs that external sounding board you the, the role of an agency is to bring the outside thinking into an organization um, and you know that's where you can you can really get pushback and being honest with one another and um, and that's where the trust can really develop. Um, the thing I was thinking about at this time, and, and Rob and Colin and I did catch up before this webinar, you'll be pleased to know we're not doing this for the first time. Um, and um, the thing I was thinking when, when we were talking, Rob, was, you know, the relationship with the agency is only a fraction of your day when you are, is particularly in this environment, right? So you've got tons of people to engage with. You've got loads of stakeholders internally. You've got loads of updates to do. You've got to be updated on lots of things and then bring that back. There's probably innovation going on in the organization as you're responding to the crisis. Pulling all of that together, um, it's really important that as consultants, we understand that that's what your day job is right now and that we are actually not your priority. The priority is the business and our priority is to help you to make that really easy for you to get the messaging out that you that you need to get out pretty quickly. So just as you're, you were saying, Rob, I think it's really important at this time that if we can, can we maybe have a few less clients to focus on? And I was thinking about that from an agency structure perspective. You can't have everybody working on five, six, seven, eight clients. It's much better to hone down and get people to work on one or two if they can during this time and restructuring your organization to do that would be brilliant. Because if you've got less clients to focus on, then you can really be in the client's business, not on clients' accounts. Um, so that you can do the thing that Rob's talking about, understanding the client's business and their strategy and knowing what your client's priorities are. Um, I've no doubt that um, all this new technology that we're using, we're all doing face-to-face -face much more and 10 minutes on a, on a Zoom um, with your client will be worth its weight in gold um, because you can see how your client is that day, you can see what their priorities are, you can shorthand so many things and, and that replaces you know, the weekly update or you know, the stuff that was all really structured in the past. Um, and you can just say, hey, you know, I've, I've, I've been thinking of you. This is the stuff I've thought about. Is that right or is that wrong? And you can get that answer pretty instantly um, because time is, it is so pressured at the moment. So many teams will have had people furloughed within their teams. Your clients will, will be under so much more pressure than they've ever been under before. Um, so just trying to be ahead of your client and anticipating what they might need is like super important. And as Rob says, Bess has clearly done an amazing job of being that generalist. So while she came in on sustainability, she's turning her hand to lots of things around the organization. Um, but also just, Rob, you, you and I have talked about this before, having the ability to just get it right first time and um, you know, knowing how the organization writes, knowing how the organization thinks, um, so that when a piece of work comes over to you, if you ask for it on a one pager, it's right first time, it's in the language, and it's something that's sort of um, you know, turnkey and ready to go, um, is really important. Um, then I've just got a couple of other points that I thought might be useful to make just as opening remarks, and then we can really get into it. Um, Rob, you talk about trust and, and best being able to open up different relationships around uh, the organization. There's, it's a strange time for us all, uh, particularly in consultancy, when the, the best moments are when you can walk the corridors, literally, in an organization. And now we're having to navigate and walk the virtual corridor. Um, and um, if, if our clients are happy for us to do that, there's a real opportunity for us to make our lives much, lives much easier for our clients. So whether we are um, you know, pulling together internal stakeholders on behalf of the client or pulling together all the agency partners on behalf of the client just to make life so much easier. Um, something that we've um, looked at is how to support the client's team. So what big presentations are coming up? How can you prepare 
the teams internally? How can you check the presentations? How can you be that voice of encouragement for them as they're going into those meetings? That sort of stuff is really important and people need support right now from us. Um, so I, I think I'll stop it there because I've, I've probably got a couple more points to make, but maybe we can get into that in our discussion. Brilliant. Thank you, uh, Rachel. And thank you, Rob. So maybe I'll kick it off with, uh, with, with, with a couple of questions for you both. Um, strikes me that, that if, you're, if you're sitting in a consultancy at a time of, of huge uncertainty and crisis like this, and let's say you're your middle ranking, you're not you know, the most senior person on the account, maybe you're an account director, an account manager, or an equivalent. Um, and to the point you made, uh, Rachel, you know, it's not just about being on an account, it's about being in your client's business, it's about being in the account. Um, a lot of it comes down to confidence and trust in yourself. Um, and there seems to me to be another aspect of this, which is developing a personal relationship with the client. In other words, Rob, personal relationship with Bess, as well as a corporate relationship between the Winston Agency, for example, and, and Rob's firm as a whole. I'm wondering what observations you both have on, on how to build confidence if you're, the, if you're the, the consultant in your ability to open up conversations with the client in a different way. And what observations you might have on the importance of those personal um, relationships. I, I think it is. Just the corporate. Go ahead, Rob. Yeah, I think that this goes back to investing the time, right? And so it's it's more it's more than just the billable hours. It's really being that part. Of, I mean, I think the greatest thing that I love about Bess, and it's what is really kind of why I connect with her, is she will randomly send me um, suggestions, ideas around trends, things that I can be I should be thinking about that I may not have time, sort of forward an article or something like that. So it's she. I see it as someone who's investing the time in me and my company, and over time that develops that that develops that kind of relationship. And you know, and I think it's also important to get together. So you know, we've invited Beth to some offsites that we've had around sustainability, and so she has spent time with the team, invested time with the team, where we may be spending two or three days together. So there's always that the work part of stuff where you're, you're sort of on calls and you're exchanging work products and things like that but there's also i think being able to join the company and be part of its its teams and really kind of spending time together that way i think also builds that personal relationship so over time you just again you as your, your work colleagues are your friends right so it's just it's to become that I, I, that person in the business and um i i don't think it happens right away um, Bess and I are unique because we've had a friendship um, outside of Avery Dennison, but I, you know, but I wouldn't have kept her on board if I didn't it, it didn't think she wasn't delivering great work, right? So she has continued to do that, and um, but it's 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 taking that extra time and commitment to the company to make sure, like where, where every day I wake up and I Avery Dennison, I know that Beth is also thinking about Avery Dennison, and and I like that in a partner, and so, but that's I think is a pretty valuable. Um, contribution. Thanks, Rob. Rachel? And that's, I think, why I was saying if we can try and reduce the number of clients that people are on, it's really important. Um, I know because, you know, we've all been in consultancies and particularly more at the mid level, but actually, you know what, now at the senior level, I would imagine it's happening more as well, where you're just trying to juggle lots of things and you do every client a disservice when you're doing that. Um, they're paying you money to be their consultant and to be in their business. Um, and I, I couldn't stress more how important I think it is to be on two, three max at the moment, but two if you can, uh, because then to Rob's point, you can be in the business, you can get ahead, you can be reading up on stuff that the client just has not got time to think about. You can, you know, we all of us are going into phase two, right? So, you know, the, the initial crisis phase is, is um, moving into innovation and returning to what new normal might be um, as, you know, uh, shops open up and, and um, restaurants and, and things will open up hopefully over time. And we've taken great learnings from friends of ours in Asia, PAC, and, you know, that region. Life will return, but it will be different. So we've got to be ahead of what's going on to try and advise our clients about what might be the good thing for them and what's what's the 
um, way that they can be seen as, as differentiated from their competitive set and being authentic to the brand. And the only way you can know that is if you are in the brand and you know what's authentic for that brand. Otherwise, you're just churning out, here's another idea for another client. That's not what clients are looking for right now. So um, being in the business, having less clients, being ahead of clients is really important. Connell, I thought I might just pick up on your other point of confidence in mid-level. Um, so again, I, th I, think it's, I think it's really tough right now. Um, a lot of client, uh, sorry, a lot of agencies structure themselves um, in a client team in quite a linear fashion with somebody at the top who's got the relationship with Rob. And then, you know, you sort of man mark through, through the client team, right? Um, there are less people within the client team because some people have been furloughed for sure and also probably some, some on the agency side too. So there's less opportunity for that. And through the last three months, the mid levels will have had so many conversations with the clients to say, hey, why don't we do that? And the client's gone, yeah, not right now. We can't do that right now. And you can take those knockbacks and knockbacks and knockbacks and try and be positive. And then eventually that might really have a, an effect on you, right? And now is the time to be thinking, well, what does the client need as we go into the next phase? And how can I be on the front foot? And, but how can I do that in a, I'm not, I'm not trying to waste your time. I'm trying to be helpful. I'm trying to help your business. Um, and, and being proactive is so important at this time, but not time wasting is also very important. It's just trying to find that balance, which is really difficult by the way. Um, and I think as, uh, really for our juniors as well, I think culturally our juniors have relied much more on email and text than they have on face-to-face -face, um, in the last few years. And it's really time for face-to-face -face again, right? We're all on, on you know, face-to-face -face technology again. So um, having the confidence to, you know, uh, get on get on a Zoom with your client and be proactive. I, I my view is, what's the worst that can happen? The client can say, "Thanks so much." They're still not quite right at the moment, but you know, think about that because we might come back to it in a month. I think that just there, there's a responsibility for the seniors and the mid levels in our organisations to give the confidence to our, our juniors and our mid levels um, to really keep being proactive because otherwise. You know, everything's going to funnel down into no, that's not right for us right now, and and everybody is looking for the positive way forward for their client organisations. Thanks both. A couple of questions have come in here, which I'm going to, going to throw you away. I think we can all see them, but in case uh, I'm not sure if everyone uh, everyone else can. So uh, first of all, thank you to everyone to, to who's who submitted a question. But I'll, I'll go to uh, Abdesh Kapoor from Sister and Burnett in Dubai first. Thank you, Abdesh. So. You're making the point about in-house teams being under pressure from their corporate bosses to deliver calm strategies and crisis plans in the current climate with limited resources and therefore unable to rely on the luxury of agency support. Do we think uh, that that is, a, that is something that is happening in-house? And I suppose, Rob, maybe one for you to pick up. Are you under, or do you, would you perceive in-house teams under pressure not to use the agency so much because of limited resources and budgets? You're breaking in and out. So I think I caught the question is like, are we under pressure um, to back on agency? I think that was the question. Right. Um, you know, it, it, we are in, in some ways. So it's, we, we had to really, you know, like almost every company, we also are impacted by COVID-19. The business, we some parts of the business are doing well and other parts not as well. And so um, we have been asked to take a closer look at, at budgets. So it, and so we have to um, rescope and rethink. Can you hear me? I don't know if I'm on yet. So, so we still have to. Hello. Hello. Well, we can hear you. Okay, sorry. It just kind of went out, so I couldn't hear anybody. I apologize. Technology is not working for me this morning. So yeah, so we have um, looked at our budgets and, and I think we have to, to scope them out a little bit different. So we might not have the full retainer, but we still need, you know, we still need help, but we still need to um, get the job done. So it just means that we have to reallocate and think, think things differently. Any thoughts on that one, Rachel? No, I, th no, I think Rob's covered that one. That's fine. Brilliant. Listen, Stephen Welch had a very interesting uh, question here uh, as well. Thank you, Stephen. Um, 
He's making the point that he's worked in both market research and management consulting sectors. And he says he sees some differences in approach between these professions. The question for the, you guys is, how would you characterize the different roles that strategic advisors can play in support of their clients' business agendas? And I think you picked up on a point you were making, Rachel, earlier on about the order taker point, you know. Uh, so maybe what sort of roles can they play and could you develop a bit of your thinking in that regard? Do you want me to take it? Please. Okay. Um, there's many different roles. Um, I, I, well, uh, and Rob, I'd love your, your point of view about this. Um, yes, of course, we must be strategic advisors. We must be ahead of our clients. We've said that many times now uh, today. I think that um, there's also a real role for creativity at the moment. Um, I don't know about you, but I am, I am seeing many stories and watching a lot of um, stuff on social media and um, through TV as well. Everything, a lot of things look the same from brands at the moment. And um, I think now is a real moment for creativity. Um, I think that harnessing creativity right now is difficult. Um, if you just think about the creative process, that's very hard. Um, I have been really heartened to see the way that people are adapting to using technology to help with creativity. Um, I was actually talking to a friend yesterday who said she ran a four hour uh, creative workshop with a client um, on fri Friday. Friday four hour meeting. I don't know why you'd schedule that, but anyway. Um, and they had about... Um, 20 of the clients on one side and about uh, 15 of them from the agency on the other and it was basically they'd done a load of work and it wasn't right and they knew it wasn't right and they needed to rebrief creative it's a really hard time to rebrief creative right so they spent a good sort of first hour making sure they got the brief right with all the right people um, on the on the call and then they went into the breakout rooms they were either on teams or on zoom and that you know that you can you can do this with all the technology now and went into proper breakout groups and worked out you know came, came up with nice creative used the whiteboard facility used the messaging facility and then came back and presented and they did that three times in a four-hour session and by the end of the session they got the new creative and it was signed off in the room now you think about how long that normally takes in the process and they actually use technology to drive the creative process to get to a quicker decision so they could move forwards I just think that's brilliant. And, and I think, so, so yes, there's trusted advisor, but there's also creative. There's clearly also, you know, crisis advisor as well. But I think we are looking, as, as I say, as we're coming into phase two um, of, of authentic ways for brands and organizations to communicate. And I, I think this is what we're going to see going forwards. And I'm delighted that technology is playing its role there. Thanks, Rachel. From your perspective, Rob, anything to add? Yeah, I, I'm sorry again, I'm having technology issues, so things are coming in and out, so hopefully you can hear me. I think what I what I need more than anything else is a great generalist, someone who can really just do all facets of communications. And so, whereas Vess was hired to handle sustainability, she's done media training, she's done media development, things like that. So. I think if you're, you, you can't be in a niche, I, I think in a niche environment, you have to be able to expand your skill set and be able to offer a lot of different things to your clients, in particular in, an, in a time where teams are being furloughed or, or you know, downsizing of teams and things like that. So the, the need for people just to pick up and be able to do a variety of different tactics. I mean, it's beyond, there's the strategy piece of it, but it's also just the tactical work of communications and having someone who can really do all that is important and I think as, as you think about as you're dealing with your own clients what can you help them with and where can you be a, a valuable partner and that goes beyond your current scope it may and again I think we all will have to roll up our sleeves and be willing to do the things that you think you may have outgrown by moving up into a more senior position um, but I think in today's day and age it, it's sort of you know it's all hands on deck and being able to do a bunch of different things. Thank you so much, Rob. I have one here which really speaks to this confidence question, I think. Uh, questioner hasn't given their name, but it, it's a simple question. How can you protect yourself if you are an agency working remotely from the corporate uh, global center of power, even if you have great relationships, trust, et cetera? What 
uh, with your regional or your continental clients, how can you still protect the relationship? What are the top tips you guys can offer? Hmm. Um, I think probably that does go back to some of the things we've been talking about. So um, what, what support does a client need now? What support is the client going to need going forwards? Who else can they put you in touch with who can make their life easier for them? You know, clearly there's HR and, and internal comms, but there's also the innovation team, the R&D team. You know, how can you make that happen for the client? Everything I think that Rob and I are talking about is how to be, how to make sure you're being proactive so that you are the eyes and ears of the client so that you're making the life of the client so much easier. And by the way, this isn't easy stuff, um, particularly if your client um, is under masses of time pressure and they're like, yeah, 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 yeah. I'll, I'll call you back in a day or so <laughs> and, and you don't get to them, you know, make sure you're reading what's happening in that sector. Make sure you're um, reading what's happening to the client and just try and be ahead of them. Um, Rob, I don't know if you have more to add to that. You know, I think we're unique because um, we're a global business and best sits in Washington, D.C. and I sit in um, Los Angeles. And so um, we always work long distance. And so for us, it's been I've introduced her globally to the team. So everybody in the regions already know her. So, so I, I, I think it's just a second what you say. I think it's being that, that true thought partner and, and understanding kind of are in the process and, and to be um, you know, proactive, but also know when to back down and, and come back and, and, and things like that. So it's worked really well with us. And I think over time, in your organization, I'm sure Bess has conversations with people within Avery Dennis that I don't even know about. Um, and that's fine by me. I don't feel like I need to know everything that's going on. But the great thing is what she can do is she could connect. Um, if she is working with a, a regional group, she connects back to sort of our broader strategy around whether it's around innovation, um, whether it's sort of what we're focused on from a sustainability standpoint. So if, for us, it's, it's kind of unique because we're a global business. We, we, we're on Google Hangouts all the time, and, and so and we're just a global team, a team around the world. So um, I have a kind of a different perspective. But it, again, it's just really, um, it's just really building those levels of trust that that they feel they can, um, and, and you have your own relationships. And if you've developed relationships in the regions that go beyond your team client contact, um, feel free, you know, reach out to them as well and be their their thought partner because you know they're. Sometimes they're kind of even more strapped than the folks at headquarters. Yeah, to, and I'll, let me just pick up on that one as well. So I, I absolutely agree with that. And having run um, uh, global accounts and regional accounts, um, is we, we were saying it earlier, how can we as consultants make our clients' life easier by actually just reaching out to all those people and and you know being that that glue, the hub to pull everybody together, um, is really important. And then I. I I think I mentioned it earlier, but most agencies work with other agency partners and sometimes that can be a little bit of a rivalry situation, but right now, you know, it couldn't be more important that you know, the, the client's team has assembled an agency team because they rate all the agencies and want them to work well together. Now is the time to really show that, that you can do that. And if you can be in, in, in a proactive leadership position to make that happen, that's only going to be good for your clients. So even thinking about, you know, maybe some of the programs that you're working on and, and Rob's mentioned sustainability a couple of times, you know, that there may, you may need to be revisiting some of the work that's happened in the past to be thinking about how to adapt that going forwards because the business model might be changing. So as an agency team, can you come together um, and think about that on behalf of the client? So you can go proactively with, we've thought about this. Um, it might not be in your agenda right now, but in, you know, in a month's time, we think it should be. So we're, we're raising this with you now. Um, as I say, just being ahead um, and pulling the relationships together would be really important. W would you both agree that, like, at a time like this, uh, uh, as you say, it is a time to pull together, uh, Rachel? Like, you know, you know, you may be sitting on a on a consultancy uh, uh, mandate, which is say consumer PR, and there will be some other agency or another team within. If you're in a very large consultancy, maybe doing the GR work or doing the corporate or doing the investor relations. And 
you know, in the good times, sometimes there's a bit of a bit of territoriality breaks out, and that can be in house as well, of course, between teams in house, and it, it, it's nearly sort of proprietary information, you know. And if you you, you, don't, you don't really want to be seen to be disloyal to your direct client by sort of having an idea about something outside your area, would you agree that this is this is the, the one time when free thinking should be welcome and should be celebrated, and that if someone has a great idea or a question? Just a question that's been exercising them. Uh, you know, it doesn't matter that you're a GR specialist. If you've been having a question about the sameness of all the consumer PR stuff that you've been consuming yourself on the on the telly or online or whatever, now is the time, isn't it, to, to just feel able to ask that in an honest and open way, not to hold back, to be really just upfront and honest and inquisitive and curious. Uh, because I think at times like this, curiosity pays off. Because curiosity leads to questions which lead to solutions and it pulls people together. I don't know if you agree or disagree. Um, I, I mean, I absolutely agree with that. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Rachel. Yeah, I would just have, I would absolutely agree to that. And I think this goes back to my point of just being someone who's a, a generalist who's going to be able to ask questions and, and punch holes in things and say, I've seen you doing this over here. Have you thought how you could apply that to what you're doing in, in this? So I think um, because sometimes you, I, I think especially at my level, you're kind of you get a, a little bit about everything, but sometimes you really don't have the time to go down to a deep dive, and you're not always working with all the people. And she can kind of starts connecting some of those dots for me, um, and I think that's I, I, you're spot on. I think that's one of the things that you have to be able to do, and so I would. You know, if you are curious about something that's going on, or if you read something about the company and say, hey, we should be thinking about applying that to our sustainability messaging and things like that, that's all the better. Again, it's that bringing that value um, to, to the relationship. Yeah, and then Connell, just to, uh, God, we're all agreeing with each other. There's, there's not much of a debate here, is there? Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so we can turn to politics if you want. <laughs> No, let's not do politics. Um, um, <laughs> yeah, uh, I've always found um, inter-agency relationships um, interesting and challenging, right? So uh, we, because we have to pitch against each other all the time for a client's attention, uh, we are fiercely competitive, aren't we? And yet uh, when we are then put into an inter-agency group, um, we have to uh, make sure that we're working well together and build trust. I genuinely think now is a moment. It's not just about building trust with your client. It's about building trust in that agency circle. Um, you know, you if, if you're leading the client relationship or, or if you're in the mids, uh, a mid-leveler, you should be phoning up your agency partners and saying, hey, <laughs> what are we going to do? How are we going to make this better? There's, there is going to be enough for us all to go around, right? So it's not, it's not about um, trying to steal budgets from each other is about trying to do the right thing for the client and we as a team will be a much much more valuable resource to our client if we pull together and and, and um put any differences or any worries that you've ever had aside and build the trust with one another now so um it's a it's a magic opportunity to make that happen um but but it's going to take a bit of you know if, if you haven't got that relationship there it's going to take some work but i would imagine that the um the reward will be very very high both for you and the agency relationship um, uh, and your relationship with your client. A couple more questions have come in, and, and thank yous to the guys at Cicero Burnet and Dubai. Uh, great engagement here. I hope I'm getting your name correctly, Reem. Uh, uh, I'm going to read out your question. Very interesting one, I think. So, uh, saying that before COVID, we were able to uh, pre plan for our clients some six to 12 months ahead, which helped maintain the client satisfaction knowing that they had their plans ready and, you know, it's sort of ready to be executed. We managed to proactively plan a two month calendar as soon as COVID hit. However, now we find ourselves in more of a reactive mode that the client's business objectives have changed drastically and find them shying away from executing most of what was suggested. What do you recommend to help maintain the proactivity level and the pre-planning? And Rachel, I'm gonna throw that back at you because I see Rob as, as possibly dropped out. So I'm gonna to, going to give you first stab at that. And it's, it's more from an agency perspective as well. Yeah, uh, it's a great question. And um, by the way, we, we know this is really tough, 
right? So um, this is a very tough environment to be in. It is, and I was trying to say that earlier, when you, when you keep going to a client and saying, hey, what about this? And they say, yeah, not now. It's really tough to, um, to stay positive and, and stay focused. I do genuinely think we are moving into phase two. Um, and uh, whilst everybody has been in crisis mode now for, for weeks and weeks and weeks, it feels like businesses are starting to understand and establish what their role is going to be, how they are going to do business going forwards and what the areas of priority are. And um, so, so even though you might not have the next six to 12 months planned out, I definitely think having a rolling um, one month ahead a uh, bank of ideas or, or a plan for them would be the right thing to do and flexibility within that plan. Um, it's, it's nice to be able to have some certainty for sure, particularly on the agency side. My goodness me, we are forecasting revenues and paying people salaries out of it. So it's something that we really must have. And it's so difficult in this time to, to work without those secured revenues. But I think, yeah, if you, if you can almost have like a, a rolling plan of one month, two months, three months ahead, and I, I, you might not even go more than three months ahead, to be honest with you, because once, um, you know, the world starts opening up again and trading starts opening up again, it, it really could be a quite a different place. So you know, more than three months might be a bit foolish unless you're doing you know, a very, very long term plan or, or your client has actually managed to um, think about what 2021 might look like. I mean, that's the only other thing that I have heard quite a lot recently is it's almost like you need a rolling plan for 2020 with the long term plan in 2021. Um, and you can probably start thinking about that as well right now, uh, depending on how your client's business is working. And you know, that segues beautifully into uh, Kerry Sheehan's question, uh, which, was, which is about innovation and supporting the drive and for the, supporting the drive of the business and the brand forward. Um, she says, we're not in our swim lanes anymore. What are the areas of innovation that you are starting to see play out? And how far do you think business brands are now willing to go with innovation rather than just trying to stay afloat? And that is probably the 21 question, isn't it? It's the post survival question, Rachel. And because, Rob, I think the technology has defeated him for now. Oh, it's such a shame. Back, back I, because to you. Oh, I'm so sad because this is a perfect Rob question because I, <laughs> I know that Avery Dennison have um, really innovated through this crisis. So if we can get him back, it would be amazing if he could answer some of this. Um, it's, clearly, it's different for, in every sector. Um, so, you know, from the restaurant business to the airline business to the recruitment business, every business is innovating in different ways. Um, I think... Oh, Rob, come back. I'm back. Sorry. <laughs> the whole thing crashed. So I think I have a better connection now. You're, oh, back. You're, so back. You're so back, Rob, in every possible sense of the word. Thank really? you so much, Rob. Right. <laughs> Sean, Rob. Can you read this question out to Rob? And can you get, because I think there, there is some real um, uh, great answers here for Rob to answer. So thanks, Rachel. I will. So, Rob, th this one co has come in from Kerry Sheehan. And it's all about innovation. So uh, it's basically, what are the areas of innovation you are starting to see play out? And how far do you think businesses or brands are now willing to go with innovation rather than just trying to stay afloat if they can? Um, I mean, I think innovation is key to any business survival, right? So um, the company, I, mean, I think for us, innovation is, is a key value and, and um, we're constantly challenged to figure out ways that we can look at our business and think forwardly in, in that. And I, and I give it in a, it's sort of just an example from our medical business that was able to really quickly pivot from um, sort of the, the production line to make um, self-adhesive N95 masks. Um, and so that was a, an innovation that they started working on within a couple of weeks of, of the crisis and, and they moved quickly to adapt. And we gave out a, you know, made a significant contribution to those masks and now they're gonna become a key product line for us from a PPE. Uh, standpoint and so um, so innovation is key not only I mean just in our product lineup but just innovating in terms of how we communicate the way that we have um, we've looked at ways that how we can leverage technology to get our CEO to communicate more directly with with our with our employees around this crisis right so uh, and so looking at new new technologies uh, we're a G suite company so we use a lot of Google product products and so 
um, we, we, we're, we look at ways that we can leverage that platform to connect with more employees in different ways. And so we've been able to do some really interesting things that way. So, and now we're completely from a market. So I also handle marketing communications and we're looking now to innovate about, you know, we know we're not going to be going to trade shows. We know we're not going to be able to connect with our customers and sort of a one-on-one -on -one personal thing. So how do we use technology to do that? So virtual product launches, yeah. um, how we led, we've leveraged Google Hangouts to continue to do webinars for our clients and, and sort of do, and so now we're looking at ways to how to, well, if we're not able to, within a year from now, be able to do trade shows, how can we continue to connect? So not only innovate in your product launches, but even innovating how you're, you're connecting with your customers or your internal employees and things like that. It's, and it's I, incredible. I'd add one thing as well to Kerry's point, that on the agency side, consulting side, there's a huge duty on us to seize this opportunity to adapt and to innovate as well. And if you think about you know, how our world has changed in, in the way we deliver a service the reliance on, you know, video technology, the reliance on, on cloud-based computing and services and support, um, you know, it is now that agencies really need to be thinking about how this, this moment, this point of inflection can drive innovation in our own services. I mean, government relations, public affairs work, as we call it in Europe, it's, it's been highly disrupted by all of this, obviously, because traditionally it involved going to physically meet people. But it need, ne it need not necessarily be so. In fact, embracing digital technology, being more research focused, being more data driven, could actually positively impact on the way we all uh, advise and deliver this type this type of work in the years ahead. So I think I think you know it is it is it is it is just a necessity, isn't it? You know, to survive we must adapt, and to yeah. adapt we have to change, yeah. and change is innovation. Yeah. I'm going to have one last question because I think we're meant to keep this to 45 ish minutes, and uh, the last question's come in from uh, Corey Camrose, who to whom we owe great data. Thanks for organising this. But it's a great question, and I think I think we'll, we'll maybe wrap up with it. So he asks, how important is it for consist consultants to have truthful, if difficult, conversations with clients? Do either of you have any advice for practitioners who find themselves having to have such a conversation? Um, that's a it's a great question, and I, I do think. It is important to have those tough conversations and and push back. And I know, um, you know, with my relationship with Bass, she's she's pretty good with that. I think she has her confidence and and her her own abilities and, and skills that she can do that. But look, I know it's challenging because I, I, you know, even as a senior person, sometimes you're in the room with a CEO and you, you're you want to push back, but you have to figure out how to do it. And it's just part. I think it's part of the part of the job of trying to figure out the the right way to finesse and to understand how to push back in a way that, um, you know, is, is not, I guess, insulting, but, but also, you know, realistic. And, you know, sometimes I'll get exuberant over something and Bess is like, eh, I'm not sure. So that's, so that again, is it's being that thought partner and that sounding board, which we all spoke about earlier, um, you know, where you have confidence to say, you know, push back and, 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 and provide that counsel that that's important. That's the reason why we have you um, is, is, is to, to have you push back on it. So I would, I would say to step up, have the confidence um, in your own, you know, your own ability to say, this is what my experience tells me, and this is what I think we should be doing. Um, and just go for it because that's what I want to hear. And, and I may push back and say, no, I don't, whatever, we're gonna do it my way. But, but I, I think you, you do need to hear alternative views and you kind of get into when you're internal sometimes and don't deal with a lot with the outside world, you get groupthink, right? So you're, you, you know, and so you're not really, you're not really seeing the bigger picture or you're missing the bigger, bigger picture because you're kind of so internalized. And so I think it's important. You absolutely have to push back. You absolutely have to think, um, think differently and, and, and push back on your clients. Right. Yeah, I mean, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, I've had two heart in my mouth moments. Uh, where I've done the big pushback. Um, <laughs> one was with a client where um, I was actually returning from maternity leave and our agency was uh, meant to be carrying out the program that we had put in place before I left and I came back and it had just all gone wrong. And, um, and so I went in and I had a real heart to heart with my client and just said, you're wasting your money on this program. Um, we are not making impact for you. You need we need we need to have another go at this um and 
um, not only, I went off and my boss said to me before I went, just don't get us fired. I said, well, I'm not going to get us fired, but I am going to have the straight conversation. And um, not only did we get rebriefed and get a much better brief out of it, but actually that was to Sainsbury's. And then they asked me to go and join them because they, they you know, they, they, she really appreciated, my director of college really appreciated that honesty. You know, it's really easy just to keep signing off a program all the time. But if it's not working, you really need someone in the agency to say that. And, and I've got another um, more recent example of that um, and it's really really senior CMO and she just said to me the thing I love about our relationship Rachel is we're one straight talking woman talking to another straight talking woman you know and and you'll tell me when we're doing stuff right on our side I'll tell you when you're doing stuff right but we'll both tell each other when we're doing stuff wrong and it's just that shorthand to you know fail fast move on um, and and of course your heart is in your mouth when you have that conversation because it's it's like that if you have it with your partner or you know with anybody but it's the right thing to do and um that way you get to much better work much more quickly with a much better relationship so whilst you may be a bit nervous to have the conversation just write everything down about what you want to say and just work through it in a very sort of logical unemotive objective way and i think you get to much better work more quickly and a better Yeah, I would agree. I would just add one other point. Um, don't overpromise things. If you, you know, you may be asked something by your client and you know deep down inside that you're not going to be able to deliver what they think you can deliver. And I think being up front and saying, look, I think this is going to be challenging. I don't think this is a story that's really going to resonate with reporters or I just don't think, you know, we're going to give it a, a great shot, but I don't want to overpromise because I think there's nothing like setting things up like that where you, you sort of prom promise the world and then that it just doesn't happen. And then you, sort of that just takes away the trust, right? So I think you have to have confidence to be able to push back and say, this is not going to work the way that you presented it, or I think we're going to have challenges to do this. Um, and and I, I think just that goes a long way. Listen, thank you both. Um, I think that was a really enjoyable discussion. I hope everyone who took the time, uh, and time is money, to, to dial in and, and, and to, to, uh, to enjoy the exchange of views would agree with me. You know, Rob, you, you flew blind literally through <laughs> two thirds of this, and I feel like it should be repackaged as a case study in, in, in how when you've been doing this for a long time, you get practiced enough to be able to, to fly blind and, and look like it's all going well. So a huge, a huge thank you for, uh, for, for that. I'm sure it was really challenging. I know you weren't hearing everything. And Rachel, you couldn't uh, have, have been a better uh, uh, co-partner uh, for Rob in this conversation. And thank you also. So listen, I think uh, PRC will be in touch in the coming weeks with the next series from the task force. I know Rachel chairs the consultancy uh, kind of group within it. And I'm sure we'll be uh, discussing what to do next. But for now, a special huge thanks to Rachel Friend and to Rob Six and to you Thank all you. Uh, for dialing in. And stay safe, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Hello.